Hey, howdy everyone. Um, this lecture here, we're going to get into bivariate statistics. And so everything up until now, there's been the phrase univariate. We've been talking about one variable at a time is for a long time. When we were talking about probabilities, we got into some joints and marginals, conditionals. In fact, that'll come back today near the end of the lecture. And so we'll get back to that. But in general, we've had a long period of time where we've been talking about one variable at a time, univariate types of problems. And so we'll talk about bivariate. We're going to talk about some simple applications within geosciences, why we might care about bivariate statistics. And we'll get into how we measure bivariate statistics, correlation, covariance, and even talk a little bit about conditional probabilities, bring that back up, and um, provide a little bit of interpretation, visualization, and so forth. Uh, if I may take a little, just a little distraction here, just got back last week from the CSPG, Canadian Society of Petroleum Geologists, Guess Out Conference. Just a shout out to David Gardner for doing a wonderful job and all the other chairs and participants in the conference. This, in fact, is a picture of all of my, um, a lot of my friends from Chevron and the geo modeling community. Of course, there are many more than these four, but um, many of the people I work closely with who attended the conference um, and we got to participate together in the conference. Just such a treat. Banff is just beautiful. But anyway, I shouldn't spend too much time on that. So bivariate relationships, why do we care about bivariate relationships? Why do we want to understand and quantify these relationships between two variables? And the answer is they matter. In fact, you, what you'll find is take this example right here where we have permeability versus porosity. If we took the individual samples of permeability and plotted them as, up as a histogram, we would have a pretty nice looking histogram. It'd probably be kind of log normal, maybe multimodal, you know, a lot going on with it, but it'd be pretty useful. We could plot up the porosity histogram, same thing. It would have kind of maybe multi-modes. These, it looks like some things are mixed together, but it has some shape to it. We can interpret that. When we look at the scatter plot between the variables, we take all of the samples, like this one right here, that has a, at one location in the earth, in the subsurface, we have porosity and permeability, and we plot them relative to each other. Now the data comes alive with a whole new dimensionality. We're able to see these relationships between the two variables visually. So this is a standard scatter plot type of a thing. And so we look at it and you immediately see brand new features you would not observed if you had simply looked at the marginal distributions, the porosity distribution, the permeability distributions. You see them when you look at both variables together. And in this case, it's beautiful because we have these really nice trends where we can see different types of, these look like grain sizes of sandstone going from very coarse to more of a medium to fine and something more silty and getting into shales. They all have different trends within the porosity permeability cross plot space. And so this is very powerful. So cross plots, a very good way to be able to visualize and understand by statistics. And so when we're talking about bivariate statistics, we're simply talking about moving beyond just one variable at a time and looking at two variables and the relationships with each other. And we encounter many cases in which we're concerned with these types of relationships. The motif of permeability versus porosity is very common when we're talking about uh, issues related to subsurface modeling for the purpose of recovery of hydrocarbons or water or any type of fluid of, out of rock, of course. But there's, of course, many different things and relationships we may be concerned with. We may be concerned about different types of mineral concentrations within the rock. And so there's a variety of reasons we might be interested. Maybe one of these is considered a contaminant or something that is an environmental issue to deal with. Maybe one of the minerals is specifically responsible for damaging the formation and inhibiting flow. And maybe we're in a situation where we can measure one of the concentrations, but maybe not the other one very well, not as accurately. Maybe it's more difficult or more expensive to do the test. So if we understand the relationship between the two variables, we, got, we get more information. In addition, if we're trying to do any type of modeling or what, we want to consider or impose those relationships so we can work with a solution space that's not non-physical, that's not, not unrealistic. If we started to build models in which we showed combinations of concentrations of chloride and illite that we're putting points out here, 
maybe that's just not physical or not expected within the setting that we're working in. So what are we quantifying? What are we looking for when we look at a cross plot and we start to think about bivariate relationships? Well, one thing that's good to look at is, the, is there a positive or a negative relationship? As one thing goes out, as one variable goes up or increases, do we see the other variable increase or do we in fact see it decrease? And so positive and negative relationships are important because that can have a big impact when we're modeling. And so we want to see in general what's the form or the feature and the scatter plots are really good for that. In addition, we also want to see if there are constraints. And so take this example that I've taken from um, Robotham from um, back from 2001 and all. I believe this is Petroleum Geosciences. I have the uh, unique identification down there if you want to look it up. And so we have a nice relationship here between acoustic impedance and porosity. And we have some general types of transitions depending on the type of rock type. If we have more cementation or dissolution, if we have more quartz or dolomite, we've seen transitions and changes within this type of relationship. This is very powerful because we can see that in fact that there's some physical constraints within this relationship between the two variables that in fact we don't anticipate to have results out here. We don't have results right here. And once again, this very much limits the feature space with some type of constraint likely driven by local, um, local types of features and rock types or maybe also driven by physical constraints on the problem. And so when we start looking at bivariate statistics, we can start identifying these types of constraints. We might also notice that the variability changes conditionally to one of the variables like we see here where there's much more variability in acoustic impedance at low porosity than there is at high porosity. We'd also want to note and acknowledge that. So there's tons we can look for in these bivariate relationships. In addition, maybe it helps us with segmentation. You could have a situation in which you have two different facies, for instance, carbonate and sandstone. And maybe the porosity and permeability have a significant amount of overlap. They have kind of the same range, but when you scatter plot them, porosity versus permeability, you find out that the difference maybe is not in the marginal or the univariate statistics of porosity and permeability, but in the shape and the behavior in the bivariate when you look at the two variables together. So in fact, we may find ourselves better able to segment and separate out different categories, bases, whatever they are, based on understanding the bivariate statistics and not just working with univariate statistics. It opens up a new world, new opportunities. So how do we quantify these bivariate statistics? Well, we can visualize. I'm always a fan of ocular inspection. You can look at the plots, and, and we've done that up until now. That's fine. But the correlations... Uh, covariances and conditional statistics give us more a quantification. So let's start out with our good friend, the Pearson's correlation coefficient. If you want to be real fancy about it, you can start talking about the Pearson's product moment correlation coefficient, but at that point you're just going over the top. Generally, people will just call this the correlation coefficient. This is the default correlation coefficient. Let's look at its formulation. The correlation coefficient represented by rho, first variable, second variable, is calculated as the, if you look at it carefully, you'll see that we've got a summation over number of samples of a product, and we have a divide by n minus one. So that's, that's starting to look like degrees of freedom. It's basically like we're averaging, but we're counting for degrees of freedom. And then there's a standardization, a division by the standard deviation of the first variable times the standard deviation of the second variable. Now, if you look at this, this should be very familiar to you because if we were to replace y with x, we would see that in fact this right part right here would simply be the sample variance if we replaced y with x. But what we've done is instead of taking an xi minus the mean of x, a centered x, and squaring it, we took that apart and we said, make one of them y, make one of them x. So what is this doing? It's calculating the way 
two things are varying with each other. It's really cool. We'll talk a little bit more about that right away. And then we're standardizing. Why do we standardize it? Well, if we remove that standardization, we simply get the covariance. And the covariance is shown right here. And so if you look up this equation, you'll see the only thing is the covariance is a non-standardized correlation coefficient. And so you'll notice that the standardization is very, very useful because what it does, it forces the correlation coefficient to be bounded by negative 1 and positive 1. Negative 1 in the case of perfect negative correlation and positive 1 in the case of perfect positive correlation. And when I say perfect, I mean can be described by a line. It's linear. Okay, so really it's a measure of the degree of linear relationship going from perfect negative to perfect positive, perfectly on a negative line going down slope or going up in a, that would be one for a positive slope. Okay, so let's just once again, we'll compare the covariance and the variance. And so if you replace the second term, so we take the sample variance, this is the equation right here, we took out the square, we just repeated it, there's no surprise, there's no astonishment there. If we take and replace one of them with y, now we have the covariance. So it's a measure of two variables varied together. Well, the variance was a measure of how one variable varies with itself. And so I, that to me really helps me understand the covariance and related to variance. I think that's very helpful. So I hope that's also helpful for you. Now, it turns out that just like the variance, the covariance is sensitive to outliers, to extreme values. It's got that kind of behavior like a squared statistic where it just gets very much shifted and moved around by anything that's extreme. Much more, the covariance is going to be sensitive to outliers within the bivariate space. So not just a univariate outlier, but an outlier that exists away from the cloud of points, maybe even within the range of each one of the variables, but the combination is outside the typical cloud or shape in the bivariate. So recognizing that sensitivity, the Spearman's rank correlation coefficient, often known as the rank correlation coefficient, provides a measure of the degree of monotonic relationship. It's not as sensitive to outliers. It's not also quite as sensitive to be something being very linear. It could have some curvature on it, and this would not be if impacted by that. It's really more concerned about the monotonic nature of the relationship. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, you'll notice that it's exactly the same as we had before. In fact, if we compare them, this equation here for the regular Pearson's correlation coefficient, look at it carefully, all we've done is replaced x and the y by the r of x and the r of y, where r is the rank transform. And so what we're doing is we're sorting the data in ascending order, as said down here, and then we replace the data with the data index. The first, the lowest value gets 1. The highest value gets n as its index and everything in between. And so we're just doing a simple sort and rank assignment. So the result is we get something that's more sensitive in the case of outliers and nonlinear behavior to some degree. It's able to pick up on things just being monotonic, um, increasing or decreasing. So let me, uh, we'll, we'll show an example worked out in Excel where we'll actually compare and contrast the two Spearman and the Pure, um, Pearson's correlation coefficients. Okay, so what about this whole idea about the correlation coefficient and negative and positive and how does that work? I think it's pretty instructive if we take a very simple example where we have a, two variables that are Gaussian and they're effectively, they're bi-Gaussian. They're related to each other in a correlation coefficient. You get a nice ellipsoidal cloud. Very simple. We've got a high correlation coefficient that's positive. We've got a very low correlation coefficient. It's negative. And you look at the two of them and the first thing you'll notice is that they're centered on zero because they're standard normal distributions. They have a mean of zero, a variance of one. And if you look at them, what you'll realize is that for this configuration right here, just pick a point. And you pick this point right here and put it in the equation, you'll see you have a negative value for x, a negative value for y. You multiply them to, with each other, and the product 
is going to be positive. It'll be a large value that's positive. You take uh, two positive values up here, you put them through this equation, and you'll find that you'll get two positives, and that in fact the product will just be a large positive value. So as you go across all of the data, the result will be, in this case, a maximally or, or a large correlation coefficient. Let's just say it'll result in a pretty large correlation coefficient. So you can just visualize and think about that. What happens when you have a negative slope? If you have a negative slope, you're comparing negative x with positive y. That results in a negative contribution to the summation. That's going to make it lower. And then we have the positive x compared to the negative y. Once again, the product will be negative. And so you can see very quickly that a line like this, the data being tilting down or sloping like that, will result in a, a large negative correlation, or I should say covariance, as shown there. So in general, we can, we can get a sense of how we end up with negative and positive correlation coefficients or covariances. Okay. Now, what else can you interpret? What can we say about the correlation coefficient? Well, I think with a lot of spatial statistics, it makes sense to kind of build that database in your head by looking at examples. And so we have these examples shown right here. And so you can very quickly get kind of sense of how it behaves. So you look at this data set right here, x versus y. It doesn't matter what they are. We're just comparing them. The correlation coefficient for this one right here would be 0.96 there's a pretty strong degree of linear behavior. There's not a lot of scatter around the line, and that results in a very high correlation coefficient. This data set right here, x versus y, look at the degree of scatter. Now, you can see kind of greater density right here, but then there's some scatter and other points at other locations. It's not a shotgun blast, but it does have pretty good scatter. That results in a 0.36. Now look at this example right here. The relationship from x to y looks to be deterministic. It looks like you have perfect prediction. In fact, if I was to venture a guess, it looks like it's a quadratic function that's just being displayed. And so that is a very beautiful relationship, but the correlation coefficient is not equal to 1. It's equal to 0.96 again. The reason being is because it's not perfectly linear. There's this curvature right here, which is disrupting the linear type of behavior in the bivariate, and that will reduce the correlation coefficient. Now, the rank correlation coefficient would likely turn out to be 1 here because of the fact that there's a nice, beautiful, monotonic behavior between the data. They're both just increasing together so lovely, and you would expect that would result once you transform it to the indices to be a correlation coefficient of 1 or a rank correlation coefficient of 1. We have this type of form right here, negative 0.97. That makes sense. It's negative. And there's a little bit of scatter. It's not 1. Now look at these examples right here. They're somewhat pathological. We got a random bivariate data cluster. We literally said just pick a random number between 0 and 2 or so and just plot data. And we made a bunch of those. And then we put one data point right here, an outlier, a bivariate outlier. In fact, it would be univariate and bivariate outlier. This would be an outlier in X, an outlier in Y, and it's an outlier in the X and Y space. And so what did we see? A correlation, correlation coefficient of 0.95. Now I said that this was random bivariate. If I had removed this data point, I can tell you this would likely have been very close to a correlation coefficient of 1. One single outlier created artificially a correlation of 0.95. And that's why we want to always visualize our data, not just calculate a correlation coefficient and move on. What happens if we go and we take that parabolic relationship and we now look at the negative and positive at the same time? What we'll see in general is that the correlation will decrease because we're further violating the assumption of linearity. And so now we're going even lower. Here we're 0.96. We had a bit of a curvature. Now we have extreme curvature. In fact, spoiler alert, if you go the whole symmetric range, 
on a parabolic um, y equals x squared between negative 1 and positive 1, the correlation coefficient will actually go all the way down to 0. Now, any time we talk about correlation, we have to throw this in, and we'll throw some funny examples in to kind of get it into our minds and make sure that we don't forget it. Correlation does not imply causation. So, just because we see a trend that as one variable goes up, the other variable goes up, it doesn't suggest that this causes that. And one of the best examples of that is churches causing crime. Now, anytime I teach this in class, I always make the comment, I'm not trying to knock churches or religion or anything. It's just a funny example. And, and so what do we learn from that? Well, the correlation is actually quite strong. We have more churches. We tend to have more crime. Does that suggest causation? And the truth is, that right there would be wrong. In order to assign causation, we would need a true experiment where one variable is manipulated, the other one, the, all the other variables are rigorously controlled. And so what are we not controlling for? What are we missing when we produce this plot? We're missing population. It turns out that population causes churches, population causes crime. Population is a latent variable that we did not consider. We have not made any effort to control for population. In fact, those of you who were concerned I was going to be anti-religious will see immediately if you identify small cities, medium cities, and large cities. If you were to work within each one of these population groups, you'd find out that there is probably no correlation between churches and crime. And so that, that's a nice example to demonstrate the issue of just willy-nilly assigning correlation, causation just because you see correlation. Now, we could spend all day doing this, and I'll do one more because it's just fun. This is one that I found. It was taken from the National Vital Statistics Reports, U.S. Department of Agriculture. I just had to stop. I just realized I didn't give credit for these graphs. They both came from Tyler um, Gitchin? I don't know, um, .com. Turns out that Tyler has a book on, what's it called, Spurious Correlations which, I don't know, I guess he found a correlation between Nicolas Cage films and swimming pool accidents. Okay, so sorry, I won't have too much fun with this, but I'll just, let me just list these two, suffer this. It turns out that if you look at the relationship between margin consum consumed and divorce rate in Maine, that there's a really nice correlation. You could plot them, you'd find that's almost on a straight line, uh, or, you know, very monotonically related to each other at least. And so... If you think about that, is that a case of margarine causing divorce? Which I guess could be, I'm just kidding. Or it could be divorce causes margin. I, I think it's fun to flip it around. And then we have another one, spiders killing people. It seems to be correlated with the length of the words used within the national spelling bee. And so all of this data is coming from National Vital Statistics reports, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and so forth. But you can see you can have a lot of fun and i think the benefit of this is well it is funny but i i do think it's kind of a, a wonderful opportunity to just kind of really make sure that we know these are brains are pattern detection engines that are like very happy to jump to causation assumptions and i think it's great to remember these silly ones so we don't do that too often all right so let's do a very simple exercise with the pearson's correlation coefficient on github in my geo data sets repository, I have a univariate nonlinear pore permeability table or set of data. It has formations A and B with permeability and porosity values. Go ahead and, and if you plot them, scatter plot them, this is what they look like. There's no mystery, they're pretty cool. If you use the Excel function Corel and just select the first data set and the second data set, you'll get the correlation coefficient. So please go ahead and calculate the correlation coefficient for both of these. And then just let's just talk about or think about how reliable those correlation coefficients will be. I'll show you the answer in three, two, one. So this is what I got. Is there any surprise here? Well, it makes sense that first of all, the correlation coefficients are positive. We wouldn't expect them to be negative. We wouldn't expect them to be zero because there's clearly some type of nice, a bit of a linear relationship going on here. And it does go in, I'm not sure which way to do it. 
Oh, yeah. It does go in this direction. Actually, that's funny. I have to go like that. Okay. It does go in that direction. Let me, sorry, let me do it like this. It goes in this direction. And so we do expect it to be positive. Now, this one has more scatter. It's a little less controlled. It looks, you know, a little less clear. And so it makes sense that this one is lower. In case you're confused at all by the procedure, I have the data set shown right here. I loaded it up into Excel. It is already in Excel, simple to do. And I calculate the correlation coefficient simply by using this command right here, Corel. I highlighted the permeability A, permeability A, I'm permeability A, porosity A columns all the way down to the base of the spreadsheet. And that's how I got the correlation coefficient. So it's pretty straightforward to work with the correlation coefficient within Excel. Now, it's always very interesting to try to get a bit of an experience with the impact of outliers within a correlation coefficient calculation. And so what I've done is, as I mentioned before, I created a data set for which I had a completely random set of X and Y values. In fact, they're both Gaussian distributed and they have no correlation with each other. So they're just a complete scatter. And then I take another data point and just put it arbitrarily far away as an outlier in X and Y and combined X and Y feature space. And so I have that outlier up here. And now I want to assess what happens to the correlation coefficient. And so I invite you to go ahead and just try this. This is one of those things that I would tell the students that just once in your life, you should just try this just so you always have this experience. So I'll review the result in three, two, one, and now. So if you do that, this is pretty interesting. For this example right here, you get a correlation of about 0.18. Now, why is it not zero? You just don't have a lot of samples. If I had enough samples, you'd see that it would converge on zero. So that's fine. I got 0.18. That's, I'm sure if I did a statistical test, I'd find out that that's not significant. Now, if you add the outlier, look at what it does. Look how much it boosts the correlation just with that one point because it is an outlier. Now, if you're curious or you want to see what that looks like in Excel, Here's how I worked it out. This Excel spreadsheet I will make available also on GitHub. All I had to do was create a set of data using the norm inverse. I got a bunch of data values and I calculated their... So then I also added, sorry, I added one outlier at the top. And so I plotted it and that's exactly how I got this information and the correlations are calculated and shown right here. Now, just in case you thought that 0.18 might be kind of significant, I still have the random functions. So every time I hit do something, it will recalculate. You see the points are jumping around and you can see that without the outlier, it's bouncing around around zero. I just got lucky that one time and had to see negative 0.12. And you can see the impact of having the outlier in there. Okay, so that's the impact of outliers. I think that was a useful exercise to just go ahead and try having an outlier. Now, what happens if we were to work with the Spearman correlation? So effectively, this is now not the Pearson correlation anymore, but the rank correlation coefficient, Spearman correlation coefficient. And so what we do is we transform all the data to have the rank transform then we plot them so now these are x rank and y rank and then the outlier will just simply have the very next rank it'll be n plus one where n was the set of random numbers it will be n plus one in both x and y so what happens if we do that go ahead and take a take an attempt at this in order to get the rank consider using the this equation right here where you can calculate the rank average. Now it's going to be in the wrong order. It's going to make the lowest value the highest number. And so you just switch it around by taking one plus the number of data that you want to work with and minus it in order to flip it. But you can get the sense of what's going on here. Okay, so I'll review the results in 
3, 2, 1. So in this case, look what happened. Without the, with the outlier, we get a 2.4, a 0.24, a 0.24, sorry, correlation coefficient. And without the outlier, we get a 0.18. So what happened here? Well, this is interesting is the influence of the outlier is diminished greatly. The rank correlation coefficient is much less sensitive to the outlier. So that's in general what we see. We see that fact that rank correlation coefficient is going to be more robust in the presence of an outlier. And so I did the same thing here. The methodology for getting the rank transform was just as I mentioned before, I have 51 data in total. So just take 52 minus the rank average. All I have to do is select as the first variable, the variable I'm considering, and then the range I'm over. And the rank average will calculate the rank within that data set. And 52 minus that will flip it around because it's going in the wrong order. And so these are, in fact, the ranks. By hitting Enter again, I caused it to start showing the decimal points, but that's not a problem. It's still an integer. And so once again, you can see how this is dancing around the without and the without liar for the rank case are both dancing around pretty close, much around zero for with the outlier and without the outlier. So the rank is much more robust. We're not having a spurious correlation coefficient, I guess I could say, given what we just talked about, just because of the fact we have an outlier. If you plot it up and try to look at what exactly that looks like, it's just like we showed before. I can make it jump around. You can see the ranks are all changing around. Things are moving around. But in general, if we go back and look at the correlation coefficients, the rank and the without and with the outlier rank are jumping around around zero. They're not so much impacted. So we get something that's a little bit more robust with the rank correlation coefficient when it comes to being able to cope with outliers. Now, every time I talk about outliers, we should be saying too that you should look at outliers, you should investigate them, you should um, determine if there's something that you should separate, if there's an error in the data and so forth. You, you know all that, but just it's good to understand. Now, what about the case when you have a y equals x squared parabolic? type of function, and I gave myself regularly spaced data along that, what is the correlation coefficient there? And so you can easily create that data set and check to see what the correlation coefficient will do over that range. I mentioned this already. It turns out it's going to be very close to zero. Now what's interesting, if you take the range between zero and one, so you only take this part right here, that will be 0.96, just like we showed before in the example in the notes. And so what we see is that the correlation coefficient is disrupted by the fact that the data is nonlinear because there's some curvature. And by the time we get to this much curvature or curve on it, it's definitely destroying the correlation coefficient. It's not indicating a strong relationship. So whenever you work with data, don't just look at the correlation coefficient. Look at the data. You might have something that's curvature and you have a really good relationship and predictability, but you don't see it because the correlation coefficient doesn't show it. Now, I'm a big fan of this. Anytime I see a relationship between two variables, I don't limit myself to the correlation coefficient. I just, I don't say I'm only going to calculate the correlation coefficient. I look for the opportunity to use the concept of conditional probability. And so take this example right here. We have permeability, porosity, we could threshold it. And we could start calculating the conditional probabilities of A given B, B given A, given are we above a porosity threshold of 15%, that would mean this is A here, and this would be B here above 200 millidarcies. And we can start calculating those, and they can be very powerful. And so this was from lecture two. I don't, we don't need to go through the calculation again. The point being, though, is that we start to see immediately that these probabilities are informative. In fact, the probability of A given B, in other words, the probability of having a high porosity, given you have a high permeability, is going to be around 50, is going to be 
around 73%. But the global probability of high porosity was 50%. And so knowing something about permeability dramatically increased or changed our probabilities of an outcome for porosity. And we can get at these conditional probabilities by segmenting, partitioning over each of the variables. So if I have a complicated relationship going on between the two variables, I'll look for the opportunity to threshold to, to test independence and to start talking about, okay, given this threshold, this is what we see for the conditional statistics or the conditional probabilities for the other variable. And I think that's very useful. In addition, thank goodness our world is rich and full of all kinds of complexity, our subsurfaces too, and so we often have to deal with multiple variables. And so I recommend if you're going to be working with multiple variables, use a matrix scatter plot like this one right here. Python and R packages have tons of ways to produce these. They're very beautiful. You can look at the bivariate relationships between the whole combinatorial of all of your variables. Typically, they'll put the histogram down the center or the diagonal because you would expect that to just be a line. If you're comparing variable one with variable one, it would just be a line. And so instead you look at the univariate histogram across the diagonals. When you look at those, look for all the different types of relationships between variables. What am I looking for when I look at them? I'm going to look for linear and nonlinear features. I'm going to see whether or not I can see locations where I think that it's more linear or less linear. These are not really super linear here. They're kind of clouds. They're not really well behaved. I look for homoscedasticity. Are there ranges over which the conditional variance is low and then it goes high? That's important. I, I can understand kind of general types of behaviors. I can try to, if I'm making an assumption of homoscedasticity, I need to check and see if I see that in the data. Here we don't see homoscedasticity. It looks like heteroscedasticity. I look for constraint relationships. You'll often see that if you're working with um, compositions or percentages, you'll see this type of relationship where there's just zones within the features where we just don't see any data at all. And that's some type of constraint, one variable constraining the other. If I have a lot of variables, I'd also want to look at the matrix. I would pr produce the correlation matrix so that I can visualize all at once the correlations with the variables. Now, what am I looking for there? Specifically, I want to see if there's banding. If there's banding, there's certain variables that are all jointly related to each other, like this, and it's repeated here because it's symmetric. I could look at those variables and see if there's a possibility for dimensional reduction. Are those variables, in fact, collinear with each other? Or maybe they're so strongly correlated, they're highly redundant. Maybe I can re remove them. So we, you would look for banding so you can identify certain variable groups. There's something different going on here versus what's going on here versus what's going on here. You can see those types of patterns. There's, in fact, different types of methods to sort the variables so that you can enhance the banding and identify these types of features. Let me just make a couple more comments here. I'd also want to see if there's a general kind of broad scatter. Do I see things that look like they're not really related to each other very well and I could compare it to the correlation coefficient? also want to look for things that look very, very much related to each other, like a straight line, and that would be indicative of perhaps something that's highly redundant, two variables that are completely correlated with each other. It wouldn't be super useful to us. Okay, so with that, I'm going to finish up my discussion on the bivariate statistics. Next, going to talk about bootstrap and do just a little, a very short discussion on bootstrap. And we'll get into some bias, into spatial analysis. There's a bunch more to come. Anyway, as usual, if you have any questions, I'm always happy to help out. All of this will be posted. The examples will be on GitHub. I hope that this is helpful to you. Okay, thank you.